I'm talking about war, education, war, and peace. I'm talking about what happens in war-torn, conflict-affected states, mainly across sub-Saharan Africa, but in other countries too, and about what happens to education there. Now, we have this accepted wisdom, the conventional wisdom, says something like this. Yes, as soon as conflict is over, we've got to get proper, universal, public education run by a proper Ministry of Education, just like in any normal country, like in Germany, like in France, like in England. And in this talk, I'm saying, why? I'm challenging this. I'm saying, why do we want that when, first of all, there's already another viable, better alternative to that public education system. And secondly, because part of the problem of government education in these types of environments is that it itself can be a factor leading to war and conflict. So those are the two aspects of my talk. Let's start with this alternative aspect, first of all. Now look, I've been researching for nearly 20 years now. It's my life's work. This unusual, strange, curious phenomenon of low-cost private education. Private education in the slums and villages across the developing world. I first discovered it for myself 18 years ago when I accidentally bumped into a low-cost private school in the slums of Hyderabad in India. And then, after I found several of these schools, many of these schools, and realized something rather exciting was going on, I then went looking deliberately for it in, in Ghana and Nigeria and West Africa, in uh, Kenya and Uganda and East Africa, different parts of India, even in rural China. And I found this extraordinary phenomenon where the majority of poor children in urban areas are not going to the public schools. They've, the parents have abandoned the public schools, and they're going to private schools. Yes, some run by NGOs and churches, but many run by proprietors, entrepreneurs, who are serving the poor in this grassroots revolution. So I, 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 I'd done this research across the world, and I was talking Private schools, I was saying private schools are good for the poor. And then people said, well, you're talking about the poor in India and different parts of Africa, but what about the most marginalized populations? What's happening to them? Can you really say private education is good for them? So I decided to do a, another research project, and I went to places like, this is South Sudan, Gadeli, just a few miles outside of, uh, of, of Juba, where signs of war are still there. I went to Somaliland. This is the, the water cart, to, the water deliverer in the streets of Hargeza, the capital. Went to Sierra Leone. These are children of stonebreakers who take big boulders and gradually whittle them down into manageable sized stones to make roads with. And I went to Liberia. These, this is one of the slums called West Point in the, in the capital, Monrovia. And I went looking for these low-cost schools and looking to find out how much I could discover about them. My initial indications weren't very positive. I talked to people who knew these countries and others, and they said, you might find some church schools, you might find some NGO schools, but you won't find those sort of schools that I've been talking about, the entrepreneur-driven, low-cost private school. And indeed, when I first arrived in, I was going on my way to Liberia, I got a call from the people who had said I was, I was, I was, I was going to meet there and they were going to help me there. And they said, oh, sorry, it's the wrong time for you to come. The, there's an inauguration of the president, and so all the important people won't be available to meet you. But for me, actually, the important people were not the president and her entourage. The important people were there to meet me. And I went looking by myself in the fly, five slums of Monrovia to see what I could find there. There were names, these, these slums, one was called West Point, another Doe community. One was called, a very evocative name, Chicken Soup Factory. And I guess you can, you can guess why it was called that. But you'd be wrong if you guessed why Red Light is so named. Red Light is named after the functioning traffic light in Monrovia. And so I went looking in there and found so many schools. Yes, church schools, yes, NGO schools, but so many of these proprietor-driven, low-cost private schools. 
And I found this school, Ronald Reagan Institute. Um, I said to my guide by this time, I said, oh, I must have a photograph of that for the Americans I know. And he said, um, but who, who's Ronald Reagan? And uh, I guess in maybe in 10, 20 years' time, we'll go and find the Donald Trump school there, maybe. <laughs> Please don't uh, object. Uh, and this is what we found. Look, there are, yes, there are those church schools. Children are there in a, in a minority there, tiny number in the government schools. But the vast majority of children, 61%, are in those private, you could call them for-profit, proprietor-driven, entrepreneurial schools that, uh, that are serving the poor. But that was a chart when we were looking at nearly 500 schools that we found in those five slums. But of course, some of the children could have gone out of the slum to government schools. I realized that, the slums. So we then did a household survey in one of those slums, Doe Community. We went around 2,000, over 2,000 uh, households, talking to the head of the household, asking, where are your children, the um, age 5 to 14, where are they? And look at that. I mean, the first figure there, you notice... 8% in government school. Next to that, you can see almost three times more children are out of school. But isn't it extraordinary? 71% of children in, those, in that slum, but likely to be across these slums, are going to these private schools, these initiatives built by people within those communities, serving those communities themselves. Quite an extraordinary initiative. But... This, this phenomenon is ubiquitous. It's there everywhere. But um, it also, in a sense, reaches the, uh, the parts that other school types do not reach. And I think I can clearly illustrate that with this map of Juba. You can see that's the, the White Nile there coming down here. And this is like the center of Juba. And then you go further afield, it gets more and more remote and dangerous as you go this way. But I've, dis I've disaggregated the schools into three types there. The government schools, the public schools, and then the proprietor schools and the non-profit schools, the church schools, and so on. And you'll see, you can see what's happening there, can't you? The government schools are all there in the safe uh, area right next to the center of town, near the airport, near the river. As you go further afield, that's where the private schools emerge, the low-cost private schools, and particularly you'll see those low-cost entrepreneurial schools that are run by entrepreneurs serving the poor. So they reach the parts other schools do not reach. They're also affordable. We can look at this in several ways, but one of the criticisms I get of my work goes like this. Well, you're talking about the poor. You're talking about the disadvantaged, the dispossessed, and you're talking about them paying money to go to private schools. But my answer is always, government schools are not free. Now, in terms of fees or levies, yes, the private schools are much more expensive than the government schools. This is data from Monrovia, again, from Liberia. Yes, you can see clearly there, the, the attendance at the private schools is much more costly to parents than the fees at the government schools. However, there are also additional costs of sending a child to school. So you need to buy, if, if you're poor, you need to buy shoes, you need to buy uniform, you need to buy books, transportation, and all these additional costs. And if you throw those in, what you see there, it's quite clearly in the middle there, the other costs, they're roughly the same in public and private. And when you add together the other costs, to the fees, you get something there, you see, yes, going to private school in red is more expensive than going to government school in, in blue, but actually it's not a million miles away. The cost to a parent of sending a child to a government school is fully 75% of the cost of sending to one of these private schools. And so it's affordable. We have other ways of looking at this, interpreting it, but we find these schools are affordable to even those parents on the poverty line in these schools, in these communities. And I like to say one of the other virtues of these low-cost private schools is that they are an educational 
peace dividend. You can see this quite clearly when you first go into these poor communities of countries like his Sierra Leone. As the war, civil war is ending, you'll find schools being created like this one. Or this one's in South Sudan. Such a simple structure, but immediately they come up. This is Somaliland, the school's being bombed out, but then it finds an alternative accommodation very, very quickly. And they're open there. Um, they're open all over these places. But we, we got the dates of their opening. We found out when these schools opened and found out something interesting. Okay, this is the overall picture. This is now Sierra Leone. So you can see where the Civil War ends there, that bold line coming down. And you see, yes, there's a gradual growth of schools over time. We can disaggregate that into the different types of schools. Well, there's lots of different types of schools there. I want to disaggregate it further and show you something that's really interesting. This is what happens. The government schools stay roughly the same number when civil war ends. But the schools that increase in number are the private proprietor schools and the church schools. And in fact, the proprietor schools are almost increasing at an exponential rate. They are serving these communities. They're serving them in a way to bring a peace dividend. They're the ones who are doing it, not the government. And my last slide about this section is preferred choice. The parents prefer the private schools to the government schools. This is some data again from the Monrovia um, household survey. And you can see all the way down, we asked them, did they prefer public or private? 82% of parents, of these 2,000 parents, preferred the private schools. Only 13% said they preferred government schools. And they knew why they preferred them. That's the key. On all, the, all these indicators here, you'll see, is it true of private school? Is it true of public school? A safe place for girls? 91% said it was true of private schools. Only 31% said true of public schools. Good quality teaching. Again, nearly 90% in the private schools only 40% in the public schools. And girls encouraged academically, 89.2% of parents said it happened in the private schools, but not there in the public schools. Parents have their reasons. I've mentioned girls a couple of times there. I could have told you more about these schools are fair to girls. Over 50% of the, of the pupil numbers are girls in these schools. It's not the case that parents don't send their girls to these schools, the low-cost private schools in these poor areas. What about that second aspect of my talk then? I said, why would you want that accepted wisdom? Why would you want the public schooling in these areas when there's a better alternative? But why would you want it when public education often contributes to civil war in the first place? And it's not me saying that. This is a, some, some quotes from UNESCO. Education, UNESCO says, is often an underlying element in the political dynamic pushing countries towards violence. How does it do it? Well, it does it perhaps in three ways. Exclude, it marginalizes, and it, it uh, oppresses. It excludes, first of all, when the one ethnic group is in government, it can exclude other ethnic groups from education altogether. Or it can marginalize those other ethnic groups by giving them an inferior or, or less education than the other ethnic groups. Or it can oppress them entirely by pushing a curriculum which says that this ethnic group or this religious group is not as good as another one. All those ways governments work. So why go for the public schooling alternative when there is this private sector alternative instead? What I'm saying to you is, Let's ignore the normal way of doing things. Let's instead go for the solution that is better. Let's have our revised wisdom in countries torn by civil war. This grassroots revolution is taking place. Embrace the private schools. Let's not go for the Ministry of Education option. These schools, the low-cost private schools, have a few friends. I'm one of the few people championing these schools as I go around the world. It'd be great if you can join me on that mission. Thank you very much.